So my friend has been bugging me for a while now to do more of these how-to videos, and he's also interested in learning Linux, which, if you know me, I really love it. Thus, I decided to smush these two things, uh, these two concepts together, and came up with this how-to install Linux uh, video idea. <laughs> you smell that? It smells like a bit goblin. Before we get into the actual installation process, let's go over some major caveats first. The first one is that today we're going to be focusing on Linux Mint, and although creating the bootable flash drive will be the same, if you want to use another Linux distribution, the process may be slightly different once you get into the installer. These can be things as small as a different layout for the interface, or as large as an entirely different installation process. I'm looking at you, Arch Linux. But for the most part, these will follow the same pattern of set your language and keyboard layout for the installer, set up your network, select what you want to install, Set up your partition layout and then create your own user as your system is installing. The second caveat is we're not going to get too deep into how to dual boot Windows in Linux today. I personally ran a dual booted system with Windows and Linux for years and I had very few problems with it, most of them being related to the hardware clock. And honestly, it's great. It's really it's a really cool thing to do. If I want Windows for games, I can just boot to Windows. If I want Linux for like everything else, I can just boot to Linux. But I do know it can be kind of tricky to get just right for your setup, since every machine will be slightly different, and it's a deep rabbit hole to get into and get it just right. And thus, we're only going to briefly touch on it. If you have any questions about this, feel free to hit me up on one of my socials, which you can find on my YouTube channel about page, or join the BitGoblin Discord server to get some help. Alright, now that that's all out of the way, let's take a look at the installation process. Before you start, you'll need a flash drive that's at least 4 gigabytes in size. This right here is 16, I believe, or 32. You can probably get away with one that's a little bit smaller, uh, depending on your Linux distribution and ISO of choice. But a lot of Linux distributions these days provide images that are well over 2 gigabytes, so 4 gigabytes is a good starting point. First thing you need to do is download the ISO image file for your Linux distribution. If you're not sure which to go with, I'd highly recommend going with Linux Mint which is a more stable experience as in packages won't change major versions as often. And it's also one that's very familiar to Windows users. Or if you want something that's a little more adventurous and better for newer hardware, then you can try Pop! OS. To do this, just go to their website, look for the download button. Some will even prompt you to, to select a mirror to download from, and you'll start the download. Next, go to ruffus.ie and download the latest version of Ruffus. This is the tool that you'll be using to flash your Linux image to your flash drive. This is a rather small download, and once it is done, you'll just want to plug in your USB drive and open Rufus. After your Linux ISO has finished downloading, which can take a while if you're on a slow connection, in Rufus, make sure the device dropdown has your flash drive selected, and then for the boot selection field, click on Select on the right. You will now need to browse to that Linux ISO that you just downloaded, which will likely reside in your downloads folder unless you have moved it. The rest of the options in this window you can leave alone for now, unless you know what you're doing, and then click start at the bottom of the window. You'll be prompted to confirm the flash, click OK, and after a hot minute, your drive will be ready. Keep in mind here that this can be kind of dangerous, which I think Rufus does a good job of not allowing you to select your like actual like Windows installation, but you can do some serious damage by getting rid of your Windows install or possibly even getting rid of like your storage drive for games or media. So again, just be careful here. At this point, if you're planning on dual booting on the same drive that your Windows install is on, now you should open up disk management and resize your Windows install. Do this, right click on the start menu, click disk management, and after a few seconds, your partition info will load. Right click your large Windows partition and select shrink volume. A window will pop up with a few fields, the first two being the total size of your partition and the amount available to shrink. I wouldn't recommend shrinking your partition all the way here, so you have some storage still for Windows, but if you can give yourself like 40, 60, or even 80 gigs of space or so, that would be great so you have some room to install packages and have room to store some files. After you click shrink, you'll be ready to do the installation. <sighs> so this next part is a little tricky part to show. Every PC manufacturer or motherboard manufacturer, if you've built your own, will have their own method of getting into the system's boot menu while booting the system. 
Typically speaking, you'll need to hold down or quickly press the F12 key on your keyboard during the splash screen while your system is booting. Sometimes this will be F11, F7, F2, delete. It, it, it just varies. Also note here, if you're on a laptop, your OEM may have disabled the boot menu and you will need to re-enable it in the BIOS. Or even sometimes it might just be locked away behind certain settings configuration. That will need to be set just right. Again, feel free to join my Discord server to ask any questions you may have, and I'll do what I can to help. So, now we're actually going to boot into the Linux installer. Plug in your newly flashed USB drive into the PC you want to install Linux on, and turn on the computer. Quickly press F12 during the splash screen, or just button mash it like I prefer to do to make sure I don't miss it. And when the menu loads, select your flash drive. It'll be the model of your drive, something like SanDisk Cruiser, PNY, or Samsung. You may also have an option for GPT or EFI, plus the name of your drive. And most machines these days really should support EFI boot, but worst case, if it doesn't work, then it should just fail to boot, or you may just need to reinstall later on. At this point, you'll be at some sort of menu like you see here, and you can select Install Linux Mint, or whatever it says here. After a hot minute, you'll come to some sort of desktop with a graphical installer, and we're kind of almost there. Alright, so from this point, the installation is pretty straightforward, but you're here for the long haul, so let's continue. These first couple of steps you'll need to change as you need, but let's go ahead and click on Install Linux Mint. Hit Continue. Uh, I'm going to keep the standard US uh, keyboard layout. I'm going to just check Install Multimedia Codecs, because I'll want that at some point. And so here we have an option to erase disk and install Linux Mint. Pretty self-explanatory, it'll just wipe your entire installation disks. If you're not going to keep Windows 10 or you have a blank computer, you can just leave that selected and then hit install now. But since we're going to dual boot here, we're going to hit something else, hit continue. And then so right here we have kind of a blank drive. If you're going to be dual booting with Windows, you'll see something like free space underneath the dev STA. Since we don't, we're going to click on New Partition Table. So from here with the free space, we're going to click Add. Then we're going to set size to like 100 megs. Or sorry, we're going to set the size to like 1000 megs. Leave the other options the same. Use as FAT32 file system and then do mount point boot EFI. Click OK. Now here, since we have a little bit of free space, we can divvy it up into other things. Like some people will want to have a separate home partition for all their files. Uh, that way, if they fill up their home partition, their computer doesn't freeze up because it doesn't have any room to write logs to and stuff. But for the next bit of free space, we're going to set the size to 25 gigs for the rest of the system. Set it to primary partition, txt4 file system, and then just do slash. Then finally, we're going to use the rest of the space available Again, primary partition, uh, ext4 file system, and then do slash home. Now what this does is for your home folder, uh, you'll have a separate partition so that if you fill this up with uh, 16 gigs or 17 gigs of space, the rest of your system is not going to crash. You can lump them all together, but that's just up to you. So we're going to leave the device for bootloader installation uh, as it is. Hit install now. Confirm the changes. Select time zone as New York. And then here, just create a user. And then hit continue. At this point, the installation will take a few minutes to finish up as it copies all the packages over and finishes setting up the system. But now you can just kick back and relax, grab a drink, and come back in a few minutes. I guess now it would be important to note that Pop! OS and a lot of other more modern distributions, like Fedora, uh, will have a slightly different installation process. Yeah, typically speaking, what they'll do is after the partition stuff, it'll install the system right there reboot and then after the reboot that's when you'll take care of setting up like the time zone and your user all right now that the installation has finished we just hit restart now and after a hot minute or so the, the system will boot back up when your system restarts it should automatically boot into your linux distribution but if it does go into windows you'll just need to restart again go back to that boot menu thing that you went into earlier and select the option for linux mint or pop os or whatever you installed so now that we're here, uh, you can just log in and you can start using it just like you would any other system. You get a little welcome dialog, which can show you some like first steps with how to get going. Choose your panel layout, all that kind of stuff, documentation, 
get some help on the forums or IRC chat if you really want to go there. And contribute, obviously, if you want to help support the project. I'm going to uncheck this because I don't really need this. Get rid of the window. So, if you uh, chose Linux Mint, like I, I recommended doing, you'll have a very similar desktop experience to that of Windows. You have a little start button down here where you can get started with, like, go into settings and go into your applications. You have your taskbar with your application icons down here with a little dock for your frequently used applications. And in the bottom right, you'll have, like, system information, time, volume, all that kind of stuff. So the first thing I'd recommend doing is updating. Now what you can do is open up your terminal and do like sudo apt update, all blah yada yada yada. But what I'd recommend doing, if you're not very familiar with Linux in the first place, is going to start and opening up the software updater. I guess it's software manager? Nope, that wasn't it. We'll use that later though. Go away. Is it update manager? Yes, that, that's what it is. My bad. Go to start and then type in update manager and that'll pop up. So welcome to the update manager, hit okay. It'll check for updates automatically. Uh, it says a new, new version of the update manager is available. Hit apply the update, type in your password and you should be good to go. Well, at, at least that updated update manager. You wanna switch to a local mirror, click yes. And all the local mirror does is it should get you a little faster uh, download speeds. Looks like it's already using a US mirror, so I'll be okay with that. And here, now you have all the updates that are available for your system. I'm going to stick with uh, installing all the updates, but you can select if you don't want to update, say, like Firefox, you can just uncheck it and it won't update Firefox. I'm going to leave everything checked and click Install Updates. Click OK. Password again. And after some time, the update should be installed. OK, so the update process is finished and it says to reboot. So let's go ahead and reboot. All right, after updating, uh, if you want to install some software, it's pretty much the same process. Just go to the start menu, type in software manager, and then let's say you want to install Steam. So you just type in Steam in the top right, go ahead and click on Steam, and then hit install. Prompted for your password yet again. Then after a few minutes, Steam should then be installed. Then if you want to do this the old fashioned way by using a command line, just open up another terminal and then use that whole sudo apt install Steam or whatever else process that we've gone through in the pop os video so at this point you're pretty much set to go and use your computer as you normally would if you want to open up firefox and start browsing websites just click on firefox and start oh i want to search or i want to go to youtube youtube.com boom youtube's there if you want to start editing some documents you can go to libreoffice which should be installed by default you can use LibreOffice Writer to open up Word documents, LibreOffice Calc to open up spreadsheets. If you want to start coding, go ahead and install Visual Studio Code or Sublime Text as you want. And yeah, you're pretty much good to go. So at this point, I think it's important to mention that most software for everyday users should be available for Linux, with the only exceptions being a lot of games, the Adobe Suite, Microsoft Office, and some others. As for games, if you install Steam and enable Proton for all games, most Windows games should be able to run, even if it's a little slower than you would otherwise expect. As for the Adobe Suite, there are open source solutions like DaVinci Resolve, Audacity, Inkscape, and others which can cover the various parts of the Adobe Suite. And LibreOffice should cover most of your Office productivity needs. <sighs> so yeah, that was quite a bit. And still yet, unfortunately, I wasn't able to cover everything in this video. Computers are actually pretty complex, and a lot of that thankfully is hidden for you when you just buy one, but when you want to actually change your operating system or even do some more advanced stuff with them, there are so many different variations of the BIOS and ways to install and boot into an OS that it's practically impossible to cover every single possibility in any sort of semi-concise video or tutorial. And even then, there are still many different Linux distributions and desktop environments which change things even further once you've got Linux installed. I've already mentioned it a few times, but go hit up the BitGoblin Discord server. It's a community that I'm starting up, and myself and anyone already there would be glad to talk to you and help you out in any way that they can. Otherwise, hit the like button if you like the video, subscribe to the channel to help me to continue to grow and make more of these awesome videos, and leave a, leave a comment with feedback or suggestions, and I will catch you in the next one.